Sigoli Swagwek, Michael Williams, Nguyen Getz, Oniote Aga Ni Wages Kale Wage Ni Wagi Deloda. Hello everyone, my name is Michael Williams. Um, I'm from the Oneida Nation, I'm Bear Clan. Uh, I drum with Madtown Singers. Uh, the first song we're going to sing is a welcome song. Uh, it is Ho Chunk, and it's just a song to start us off and welcome everybody uh, to this space and for this event. Thank you. The next song we're going to sing is an honor song to welcome everybody here and to welcome our speaker and to welcome uh, or to honor our speaker and to honor this event and uh, the space that we're using. And if you could all please remove your ha headgear and stand um, in respect of this song, that'd be appreciated.
Hadinia Shine. Good evening. My name is Lorenzo Godino, and I'm a citizen of the Fort Sill Chiricahua Warm Springs Apache Nation. I'm a second year law student here at the University of Wisconsin Law School, and I'm also the co president of the Indigenous Law Student Association. Before we begin, I was asked to do a land acknowledgement. The University of Wisconsin Madison occupies Ho Chunk land, a place the nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths every day. I would also like to thank my brothers from Madtown Singers for welcoming us in a good way with those songs. So if we could please give them another round of applause. I'm thrilled to be here today with everyone because I have begun to meet and know tonight's speaker over the past year or so. We first met at last year's Federal Indian Law Conference in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We shared a meal, and there she also joined in the Ho-Chunk traditional chief's jokes about my baby face, and everyone thought it was a good old time to eat and laugh about me. <laughs> Since then, we ran into each other this past summer while I was interning for the Ho-Chunk Department of Justice. There, I was honored to meet her family, her community, and learn more about the resilience embedded throughout the Ho-Chunk Nation. I, just as much as all of you, am dying to learn more about indigenuity this evening. Now, it is my privilege to introduce Provost Carl Schultz. Carl Schultz began serving as Provost in August 2019, six years, after six years as a Dean of the College of Letters and Sciences here at UW-Madison. Provost Schultz is also the Nellie June Gray Professor of Economic Policy in the Department of Economics where he joined in 1988. From 1997 to 98, Provost Schultz was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax, for tax Analysis at the United States Treasury Department. And from 1990 to 91, he was a senior staff economist at the Council of Economic Advisors. Professor Schultz is an internationally respected economist whose work on household saving, low wage labor markets, financial barriers to higher education, and bankruptcy has appeared in leading economics journals. Amongst his many duties and responsibilities, Provost Schultz remains passionate about undergraduate education and lifetime learning. Please join me in welcoming Provost Schultz to the stage. Uh, thank you very, very much, Lorenzo, for that uh, kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be here tonight. I'm thrilled to see how many people are here. Uh, my job is to start by welcoming students, faculty, staff, community members to the beautiful Shannon Hall this evening. I'd like to thank our shared future for organizing this event as part of the Distinguished Lecture Series. As Lorenzo mentioned, this campus sits on land that was home to the Ho-Chunk people for thousands of years. So long before this place was called Wisconsin or Madison or UW-Madison, it was called Dejob, and it is a sacred place to the Ho-Chunk people. Many in the university community have learned that only recently because we, as an institution, have not historically been mindful of our relationship with the people who are here before us. We are working to change that. I hope you all noticed the Our Shared Future heritage marker in the lobby as you came in. The marker recognizes this land as the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk, 
acknowledges their forcible removal from the area, and honors their history of resistance and resilience. We are deeply grateful to the Ho-Chunk people who worked with us to draft the marker's language and who continued to collaborate with us to illuminate the history of this very special place. The marker's formal dedication in June launched a new effort to teach our shared history. After tonight, the marker will be in Bascom Hall and over the next year, it will be moving around to key sites on campus before it's permanently installed on Bascom Hill when the construction there is finished. The marker's presence at different campus locations will serve as a catalyst for learning. Each school, college, or department that hosts the marker will present a series of at least four events or activities to deepen understanding of indigenous history and culture. As Chancellor Blank said in dedicating the marker, no plaque or monument can ever adequately convey a complicated and difficult history, but they can start a conversation that begins to move us from ignorance to awareness. Tonight's discussion is an important part of that conversation. It's my extraordinarily great pleasure and honor to introduce this evening's lecturer, attorney Samantha Skenendor. She's a 2001 graduate of UW-Madison and received her JD from the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. We are very proud to call her an alumna. Samantha is an expert on federal Indian law and tribal law. She recently completed a four-year elected term associate as Associate Justice of the Ho-Chunk Nation Supreme Court. As an attorney with Quarles and Brady, she advises tribal and corporate clients in many different areas, including historic preservation, cultural resources, real estate, tribal governance, corporate transactions, labor issues, and litigation. In a word, she does it all. She has represented over 20 tribes, tribal companies, and tribal organizations, and her experience extends to representing clients before members of Congress, congressional committees, and agencies in order to observe the federal trust and government-to-government -government relationships between tribes and the United States. We are, again, deeply honored and thrilled that she is here this evening. Please join me in giving a very warm badger welcome to Samantha Skenendor. Good evening. How are you doing? Good. Okay, I am not a boring lecturer. There's a reason why I was picked. We're gonna have fun. Um, just like you back in the 90s, I used to sit in this very auditorium and hear distinguished lecture series, and it's such a privilege to be the one standing in front of you today. So I have so much to share, and I'm excited to get started. Um, first, I wanna acknowledge, though, Chancellor Blank. I know she's not here tonight, but she did make a special request for me to come up Bascom Hill, which I still was huffing and puffing about, um, and sit in her office and visit with her this afternoon. Uh, I was so happy to hear that her, her administration and her agenda was really focused on diversifying this campus. It's so refreshing to hear that. It's so hard as first-generation college students to come to this massive place with all of this diversity and feel at home and stay. Um, so we did have that discussion. I want to share that, that mission from the chancellor and that we strongly support it. I offered any support she needs to make sure that we are increasing our numbers here at UW and we are sharing our culture with, with everybody around the world. I also want to um, acknowledge Janice Rice. Are you here tonight? <laughs> right up front. <laughs> Uh, Janice is one of my relatives, my Ho-Chunk relatives. She's also an elder from the Ho-Chunk Nation. She is uh, a longtime staple to this community. Um, she worked in library sciences as a librarian here at UW, helped me finish papers um, on time and substantively accurate, I would say. Um, 
to get a degree. <laughs> so thank you, Janice. Um, more than her being resourceful on campus, Janice has been um, a mother hen to a lot of Native students over the, the several decades that she's been serving this campus. So thank you, Janice, for being here tonight and, and continuing to serve the mission of this campus. Um, wanted to also acknowledge quickly Omar. Is Omar here? Omar's right up here. Hi, Omar. I know on campus you're learning what it's like as students to make things really happen and doing them yourselves. Um, Omar's a get it done kind of guy. Um, I met Omar years ago and it's, it's nice to call him a friend and thank you for helping me be here tonight. I appreciate all that you did. Um, Aaron Birdbear, are you here? Aaron Birdbear. Aaron Birdbear is the Assistant Dean at Student Diversity Programs in the School of Ed. Aaron is a shaker and mover. He is propelling this university forward in diversity and indigenous studies. So thank you for all that you do for this community. I also want to say thank you to my brothers from Madtown Singers. Where are you at? Yes, thank you. That, that honor song was beautiful and I, I really enjoyed it back here behind the black curtain. So thank you. <laughs> Um, also want to talk, um, I, I know this often gets left out and it would be unfair for me to stand before you. I am only here because I'm a product of the professors at this university. So I won't name them all off because it, it really took more than a village, it took like a country to get me through school. Um, I just want to point out though, all the UW, Indian Studies, past and present professors, those visiting professors, those adjuncts from all those different nations, all those different places around the world that came here to share, just like we're doing tonight, to share their culture and share their knowledge and their indigenuity with people like me so that I could learn and take that on another level and share it with you. Um, names, of course, Ada Deer. Are you here, Ada? <laughs> Ada's famous for chasing around the Native students and making sure we got our work done and then some. Um, Roberta Hill Whiteman from Oneida. Are you here, Roberta? <laughs> Wonderful professor. Gary Sandifer, who is the former Dean of Letters and, and, Letters and Science. Um, Jim Leary, are you here, Jim? Professor Leary? Okay, well those are just some names. If, you, if you've heard those names, for, can we have a round for Jim? <laughs> Can't leave him off. So I want to make sure, first and foremost, you know why I'm here. It was, if it wasn't for every single one of these people and many, many more, um, I'm not sure I would have a, a wonderful degree from this great university and do the work that I get to do that I just can't wait to share with you tonight. So we'll move on. Um, Chinook Maninga Hingaide. That is my, my Indian name, as we call it. Um, it means woman walking fast into the town. I come to you from the Deer Clan of the Ho-Chunk Nation. And it's important to express my sincere apologies to my elders and my male relatives for speaking tonight. And it chokes me up a little because it's uncomfortable. <laughs> um, so why it's uncomfortable is that it's not customary for people like me to speak about matters that involve traditions and culture. Our duties and obligations as individual human beings are organized in our tribe. They're organized by clan. They're organized by age, by gender, and also by capacity. There are special rights and honors that those that are the male patriarchs of these clans that can bestow upon you. And you can deviate from these normal duties and obligations. And from the Deer Clan, we are not speakers for our people. We are also not cultural experts. In fact, what I am, um, I'm not a tribal leader at all. Um, I'm not a clan leader, and I'm not holding a, a, any title that would impress upon you any, any sort of dignity or right to speak about my own tribe or our culture and traditions. In fact, I'm actually proudly what we refer to internally as a worker bee. And that's what I'm doing here today. I'm working. Workers are in fact very impactful. Like worker bees, we keep the wheels of our community turning. We do this by task by task and meal by meal. That's what we do. Over the years, I've been privileged to ask to do work Work that when the topic arises, it makes Indian country literally come to a halt. Work where when in discussion and when in discussion ensues, people in the room literally do not even move. They don't flinch, 
And sometimes when I'm watching them, they don't even blink. I have been asked to do work that the English language cannot accurately describe. It doesn't capture it. To say that I save cultural items and sacred places from loss or irreversible harm really simply falls short. But I tell you, after 15 years of working for over 20 tribes, there's a couple of things I've learned along the way that I want to impress upon you. One of those things is that it is much easier to stop loss and damage than it is to try to fix it or get it back later. If you're learned in your early 20s, you've probably experienced um, this lesson, and I continue to experience it time and time again when I'm hired to do certain work. I want to disclaim anything that I say. It's not reflective of, of my firm or my family. It is simply my experience as an attorney, as a person from this community, as a first-generation college student, as a hired gun to Indian country, and somebody who cares very deeply about this community. So let's talk about why we're here tonight. We're really here to talk about culture. We live in a culture of colonial domination. You hear these words often in the books that you read at your accelerated levels. You hear about domination, conquerors, the doctrine of discovery, the crown, the explorer, the founder, the founding fathers. There is not a state in this union that does not bear their names. Their faces are carved in our mountains. They are loved for taking, they're loved for stealing, they're loved for killing, and they're loved for oppressing. For advancing their country's interests and for making the rich just a bit more richer. They have written the history books both you and I have read. They have written the laws that I have studied and that I continue to practice every day. They have shaped our body of politics. They have birthed what is known as the American dream. They have shaped the concept of the patriot. They have determined the necessity of war, the loss of life, yours and mine alike. But the interesting thing of all of that fact is that none of those people are in the room with us tonight. In fact, none of those founding fathers in our reality of colonial domination even walks the earth today. We walk it. We walk it in a shared space. De joke. How did we get so removed from where we are? Do you ever ask yourself that question? Are we so blindly head led to perpetuate colonial domination? Maybe. But if you think about it, these colonists, these Christianizers, their stay in Indian country is yet so ever brief some 500 years. Our tribal history goes back before any Boston Tea Party, before any American Revolution, or any World War. It goes back literally thousands of years to when we as humans, the two-legged, began to walk on this earth. I have worked on indigenous historic sites that have been carbon dated to ages more than 10,000 years old sites that match the indigenous oral tradition. Sites aboriginal to various tribes that survived extinction from California all the way to Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. They still are here to tell their stories. We are still here to share these shared spaces with you. So what are these shared spaces that I'm talking of? They are the nucleus of negotiating coexistence. I know that's a lot, but I'll say it again. They are the nucleus of negotiating coexistence. They are forums of tolerance. They take on many forms and functions. For example, they're referred to places of the gods, places of worship, places of the supernatural. 
the divine, the awe-inspiring, where spirits converge, places of mystery, places of miracles, of extraordinary things, of powerful energies, also places that are taboo, that are forbidden, places of death, places of life, places of birth, of sacrifice, and places of prayer. We walk in these spaces often, but we are unaware. In fact, I would like to guess that every single person in this room has walked through one of these spaces today and doesn't know about it. They can be on real property. They can be a body of water. They could be under the surface, naked to your eye and unknown to you. They can be in any city, any state, any country. These untrained eyes of ours are our inexperienced eyes. We're sure to miss many of these special places. Generally speaking, there are no maps, there are no guides, there's no playbook for colonial domination to destroy what's left of these sacred places. But I assure you, I assure you, I've seen many and they do exist. But I do also caution you, the record behind them is getting smaller. It is not what it once was. Practices of colonial domination sure left its mark. Just down the road from where we're sitting now, there used to be a popular Sunday practice of looting indigenous mounds after church. Did you know that? Who, knows? Who knew that? Let's raise your hand. Who knew that? Sunday afternoon, let's go loot the burial mounds. Common thing here in Madison. In the State Historical Society archives, if you walk right across the street here, you'll find photos of colonizers enjoying picnics with their children while digging into these monuments, proudly exposing and, and disturbing these human remains. And guess what? Ho-Chunk families were not gone. I'm standing here, right? We were not extinct. In fact, a lot of our people still live nearby, like the White Horse family, who still owns a portion of the original parcel near the Beltline and Stoughton Road. And just west of the White Horse, of the White Horse family was the White Wing family, they lived there for many generations. They no longer live in Dejope, but the park where they, their home site was located is now named Ahuska Park. Ahu means wing, ska means white, white wing, after the family, to honor them. Yes, I'm here to make sure that you're clear that the land we talk about, the land acknowledgement that we just discussed here in our opening, that land was certainly stolen. Religious sites and items were burned to the ground. Children, indigenous children, were literally ripped from their mother's arms and taken to boarding schools. There, they were forced to assimilate to colonial culture, or beaten, or even killed. Elders today still carry these stories. The elders that walk this earth still have those stories, and we need to listen to them. And this is how colonial dominance works, right? You divide and you conquer. You take the land, you instill fear, you force assimilation, you take control of the people's cultural identity. You destroy it, and if you can't do that, you destroy them. You justify your actions, and then you repeat them. This is all basic human psychology of how you dominate another human being, another group of people. Some might argue that these are superficial facts. Perhaps even mentioning them to you tonight may seem a bit extreme, or otherwise non-consumable. But I have a lot of faith in you. Anyone that has been to Cultural Sensitivity 101 knows that all sensitivity to another's culture begins with awareness. So let's get woke together. So the value of cultural property. Anybody see National Treasure? How about what's, what's the Egyptian movie we watch all the time? The Mummy, the Mummy, right? 
cultural artifacts. Um, so the value, the value of cultural property. This is something I think maybe your parents probably didn't sit down and talk to you about. We talk very often about money. Most parents talk about money to their children every week. But do they talk about cultural property that has an equal value or even a greater value? The value of cultural property is actually not measurable. Cultural property is actually the fabric and the foundation of indigenous people's origin, their history, and their identity. The importance of indigenous cultural property makes them targets for exploitation, theft, and irreversible harm. Indigenous cultural property is inherently rare, and it must sustain its integrity in poor weather conditions, absent or negligent caretaking, and other environmental actions. Authentic, meaning the real thing, the real McCoy here, the authentic indigenous cultural property cannot be reproduced. It cannot. Indigenous cultural property is therefore at risk for loss and irreversible harm. So this is one of those things that can go away rather quickly. And I've worked on many cases to say that it sadly does. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the day job sites. Tonight, we unfortunately don't have enough time to go and venture in through an aerial view, talk about the location, the cross streets, a good time to go, what to do when you get there. Those are all things I'm going to leave to you. You live here. You have full access with boots on the ground to go check these places out. One is right over here at Picnic Point. It's probably the closest one to where we are. There's a mound site there, and I highly encourage you to look into all of the details you can find and go explore it. Go sit out there, take it in, reflect, read a book. Don't go hastily to walk by and glance or take a picture or a selfie. <laughs> sit down and enjoy that place. It's there for a reason. Hudson Mound Group on Mon um, Monona side. Um, a lot of those uh, mound sites are, um, are built into some of the residential homes these days. In fact, two years ago, I took a, a, a representative from the state of Ohio on a tour with the state archaeologist, and we went to the Hudson Mound Group. And when we were there, the local neighbors came running out, and they said, are you an official from the Ho-Chunk Nation? And I said, well, kind of. <laughs> I said, what can I help you with? And they said, do you know the game Pokemon Go? And I said, I do. And they said, well, look at the mound. It's been trampled, and we are out here 24 hours a day kicking off kids, stepping over and, and doing all kinds of things on these mounds. And so certainly that had to be reported. The game pieces were made to invite kids to park, to parks and enjoy them. But the game makers didn't realize that the parks here in the city of Madison and where the effigy and mound cultures are located are full of these sacred sites and burial sites. And it was literally a game piece that was asking them to come and trample these burial sites. So we had a cease and desist order sent to the game maker of Pokemon Go. Vilas Park Mound Group. Has anybody been to Henry Vilas Zoo? Wonderful place, right? So there's a bluff where the aviary is, and up there, there are some old marker trees, some old oak trees. If you want to know what a marker tree, I'm giving you an assignment to find out what a marker tree is. <laughs> Head up um, on top of that hill, and you will find the Vilas Mound Group. Um, there are some beautiful, visible mounds. The city of Madison has been maintaining them for many years and they are in beautiful condition. And there's a playground out there for kids, so kids can have something to do too while you, you spend some time up there. The Observatory Hill Mound Group, right up here. Beautiful Mound Group, there was a dedication not that long ago. I loved hearing that we're in an era where we're acknowledging these very special places and we're putting monuments up and we're teaching each other about their meaning and we're sharing them with others. Um, that was certainly not how it was here in the 90s. Um, and so it's nice to see us moving in that direction of revitalization, re our heritage being revitalized. Bear Mound Park. This is one of my special places here in town. The Bear Clan in Ho-Chunk culture is our law enforcers. They're the police. They're the compliance. If you're acting up, they will come and tell you what it is you're doing wrong and stop you from doing it. 
when I was a kid growing up and going to powwows, the Bear Clan members used to wear denim jackets and red bandanas around their arms. And they would walk around the powwow grounds and the campsites and they would keep order. They would kick down your fire if it was running too long. If you were talking in your tent, they would come by and tell you not to talk. Um, they would make sure once you come in, you stayed in. They were, they were doing their jobs and to this day, our Ho-Chunk gatherings have the, the Bear Clan members, they wear Bear Clan t-shirts now, <laughs> um, they come and they make sure there's order and that the rules are being followed and they have full authority, just like the police do in some regards, <laughs> probably more than the, the local police, to make sure that you are behaving appropriately when our people are together. So Bear Mound Park is um, just nearby Henry Vilas Park. And if you ever take the time to go up there and sit, that power from that bare effigy mound is amazing. And I challenge you to go out there and sit and just take it in. I also want to talk about some other sacred sites. Some of you may be wanderers, like myself and my husband, who's sitting up here in the front row. We like to wander off. We like to go places. We have no idea what's there. This past weekend when we went to Dubuque and we spent a couple of days going through the trails and the museums and learning about the area. One of the greatest places I think that we can talk about um, and it's worth a short trip towards the Dells is Man Mound. Man Mound is the only mound left that's shaped like a human being. It's large, it's impressive, it moves you just looking at it. Unfortunately, during one time, a road went through the legs of Man Mound, and it still has its legs severed to this day. There is a Man Mound um, historical group that does preserve the mound and has special events throughout the year. So I would challenge you to look up Man Mound and make a trip and check that out. The next two sacred sites I want to talk to you about are sites that I worked on. The first is the Kingsley Bend Mound Group. The Kingsley Bend Mound Group is a little over 20 acres. It's off of Highway 16 near Dells. And it used to be a Wisconsin DOT wayside. I'm not sure you look a lot younger than I, but when I was a kid, I love saying that, when I was a kid, our parents would stop at these waysides and feed us our bologna sandwiches. We didn't go to McDonald's. We didn't go to Quick Trip. We went to the wayside, used the bathrooms there, had a picnic and got back in the car and continued to travel. One of those places was the Kingsley Bend area, a DOT wayside that included over 20 acres of mounds. And the mounds actually spilled over across Highway 16 into what is now a, a local farmer's property. So many of them were obliterated when that, that road went through. Um, the DOT had some problems, just like a lot of state and governments around the country, in maintaining parks and waysides. They're expensive. They don't have enough surveillance. Things happen there in the dark, right? <laughs> a lot of liability. Um, and, and Ho Trunk was um, happy enough to be approached by the DOT to say, hey, uh, you know, could you help out with this site? We're, we don't feel we're doing a good enough job in maintaining the site. And so the Ho Trunk Nation sent its crews down to this wayside, cut the grass, cleared the inappropriate vegetation, helped out with the site as much as it could for years. And finally, through a legal instrument, the DOT transferred the site back to the Ho-Chunk Nation for education purposes. And that's why I'm talking about it with you. The site is still preserved. You could see it on your lower left area. There is Ho-Chunk signage there. And it helps direct you to your appropriate behavior while visiting the site. I would strongly encourage that you park and again, sit and spend some time at Kingsley Ben Moan. Another case that I took on was for the Wampanoag tribe out of Massachusetts. Today's, in today's date, they have two large bands. Um, one of the bands is the Aquina Band, which their home site is on Martha's Vineyard in Aquina. When I went, got out of law school and I took the Wisconsin bar and started practice here just down the road on Capitol Square, I asked my employer at that time, the law firm of White Hirschbeck Dudek, I said, you know, I've been following a case the last three years I was in law school where this tribe that was just re-recognized in 1985 was about to have one of their most sacred sites just demolished by a wind turbine farm. 
And I remember the managing partner looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I said, you know, this tribe, they don't have gaming. They're very poor. Again, they're just being restored, their federal relationship with the government. I'm asking if we could take this on as a pro bono case. I think I can help save that site from destruction. And so after we did all our legal vetting, the firm gave me their blessing to offer to the chairwoman of the tribe an opportunity for some pro bono work to help them defend their sacred site. So what was their sacred site? Well, this was a new one for me. I'm from the Midwest. I'm used to really obvious mounds, right, mound sites? Where everybody knows, hey, there's somewhere you shouldn't be stepping or digging. Very obvious. Well, not all tribes have that luxury. Some of their sacred sites are not seen at all. Some are very, very hard to find, and some are underwater. So this took my, me out of my comfort zone, legally, to try to preserve a site that was actually the compressed shoal of the ocean. Who has been to Nantucket Sound? Who eats seafood in Nantucket Sound? Because that's the place to eat seafood. I've been to Nantucket Sound, and I thought the skyline was beautiful looking out to the ocean in Martha's Vineyard off the coast. When I went to meet with the chairwoman, she showed me this beautiful sacred site that began at the coast of what you now know as Nantucket Sound, the coastline. But she explained that that coastline was not always there. They had been there since time immemorial, just like the Ho-Chunks have been in Dejope. And since time immemorial, one of their daily routines and customs were that all the tribal members would congregate on the shore, the shoreline, and they would wait for the sun to come up. And where the light came up over the ocean, it was called the first light in their language. And they called themselves the people of the first light because they would congregate in the sacred space and they would pray as that light would fill up the skies. Well, the odd thing about that was over time, the shoal had moved. It had folded over the sacred altar. And it wasn't just an altar. There were all kinds of things in the ground. There were all kinds of burials and other items that were part of this space, this altar that they had prayed, prayed from for thousands of years. Oddly enough, the shoal rolled right over that site and softly compressed it down over time. It was the understanding of the tribe that everything was fully intact and it was a shallow ocean area, Nantucket Sound. So the folks that were moving to clean energy, including wind energy, were looking at offshore wind turbines. How do you make a cost-effective wind turbine? You can't put it in the deep ocean. Do you, do you make a platform? How much does it cost to make a platform? How much does it cost to tether individual units? For whatever reason, Cape Wind decided that they had proposed and they had processed through the administrative process, processes that were, to go ahead and propose numerous turbines to be tethered into this shoal where this altar was. Well, the hard part about all of this is that the National Historic Preservation Act requires that federal agencies that have to process these permits, right, these drilling permits in the shoal of the ocean, that they have to consult the tribe. And all through law school, I watched the chairwoman of the tribe, the tribal historic preservation officer, beg and plead with that in every way and use up all of that consultation power they had to let them know that this permit should be denied, this project should not go forward. In fact, they were glad to endorse a wind turbine in any other location, and they would help, help the applicant find this place. But Cape Wind didn't budge. And so that's when we took over and we looked at the case from the substantive side. Now, what does this involve? It involves underwater archaeology, right? How do you test for this underwater archaeology to prove that this claim of what's in the ground is in the ground? And when we started interviewing underwater folks, specialists, experts, archaeologists, they were only trained in shipwrecks. Can you imagine that shipwrecks? looking for gold and treasures in that, that box, pirate materials. Oh, they were experts. We just screened them through and through. But there wasn't one single expert that worked with Native American sites that were underwater. And to this day, that's still a huge demanded area. So 
With our oral history and us using the process, we were able to convince the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation that this would be irreversible harm to this cultural site. And not only would they drill into this site, but they would ruin the view. Can you imagine them praying in between locations of wind turbines that were tethering and moving in the ocean current? There's no way to reverse that. So we, did, we were successful on the administrative level and Cape Wind did pull out of the project. And as of today, Nantucket Sound and the, the, the place of prayer is still intact as it was. Thank you. So one thing about this colonial dominance that I think I would love to share about this practice of Indian law with you to help you understand and again be woke. Let's talk about federal policy. I studied international law at the University of Geneva for a summer and lived in Switzerland. And while there, the UN was commencing its, its work on indigenous people's law. The United States was, as usual, trying to figure out whether or not it wanted to fund or be part of any, any initiatives that would preserve indigenous people's rights. If you ever have a chance to look up the Declaration of Indigenous um, Peoples, please look at the basic human civil rights that indigenous peoples worldwide are demanding to the United Nations. In fact, my professor from the University of Denver, which is the reason why I left this campus to go work for her, Kristen Carpenter, a Harvard Law Cherokee attorney who works with sacred site preservation. She is now one of the charged advocates on preserving indigenous civil rights because without these, we feel that our sacred sites will go away. So American law, I tell you one thing that was really interesting. When I was at the UN, and I was invited by Professor Bill Rice from the University of Tulsa to come down on the floor of the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland, and meet all of the indigenous leaders that were attending and advocating for their own rights at this, at this forum. I couldn't believe what I saw. It was literally like National Geographic Live. We had leaders from all parts of the world, all continents, come in and speak in seven different languages and tell the United Nations what mattered to them, how consumer, consumer law has, has affected them, how trade has affected them, how enviro, environmental genocide has affected them. And it was alarming to sit through eight hours a day of testimony with all these indigenous people. And the funny thing I took away was that when I sat with them in the lounge for hours after the testimony was over, numerous times these leaders said, wow, we hardly see any indigenous peoples from the United States here. We know your streets are paved with gold. You have no reason to come to the UN and ask for anything. And my eyes lit up because I thought, are you kidding me? We have some of the worst indigenous policies known on the face of this earth. And, and so I want to introduce to you why we have the worst indigenous federal law on the face of the earth. And this is something they wanted to model. I said, you don't want this law. <laughs> you don't want this law. So pre-constitution, does everybody think something started with 1492? I'd like to think you're here because you know that's not true, right? <laughs> okay, we're starting from a good, good shared space here. Um, so I want to help you envision what happened before 1492 in Dejope? Was it empty? Can you picture wigwams all the way around behind where you're sitting? What is now known as Lake Mendota? All the way around. Wigwams all the way up and down the isthmus around Lake Monona and the other two lakes. The chief's village over at Henry Vilas Sioux and those mounds we talked about were already there. Can we talk about that where the state capital lies, that that was an international council area where tribal leaders coming up the rivers and coming from the, across the lakes would come here and meet with tribal leaders from this region. They would come down from Canada, northern Wisconsin, northern Minnesota, the Dakotas, Michigan, and they would meet here in Madison. It's a historical place of international law. And all of the tribes throughout all these forced removals, have seemed to keep it together in terms of culture. Like my tribe, Ho-Chunk, which is patriarchal. There are many stories of how we interrelate with each other, which
Which tribes can marry with which tribes? Which clans can marry other clans? How the balance works, how the clans work, how the duties are shared and evenly distributed. This was an international zone, and it certainly is as well today. So that is the, the prehistory of 1492. There were all kinds of laws about territories, how you behave when you come into Ho-Chunk territory, what's expected of you when you go into Potawatomi country or Menominee country, how you behave as a man and as a woman or as a child. There are things you are to do and observe while you're there visiting. Just like if you were to get, stamp your passport and go to any other country, there are expectations of you as guests to that country. And so all those international laws applied here in Dejop as well. So pre-constitution, when the colonized, when the explorers came to this area, they recognized and recorded time and time again their interactions with the first, what they called the first people. If you ever read the Jesuit diaries, they have now been translated from French to English, you will see some of these old accounts of these first written recollections of indigenous people, mostly Ho-Chunk, oddly enough. You will see how they recorded, and they had such fine language to describe what they saw. Healthy, strong people, people that lived off the earth, people that didn't have a crown, who didn't pay taxes, who treated guests from other countries with the utmost hospitality. It was foreign to them. They had no idea what God in their era would allow this type of living to take place. If it wasn't for their own inability to physically survive, they probably wouldn't have cared much about this culture, but they recorded it. And I, I challenge you to go to the state archives, the national archives, and the regional archives to read some of these accounts and the Jesuit diaries of what they first saw when they came to this area. We move into the formative years. And the formative years are a lot about the treaty era. We hear about Indian treaties and casinos left and right. Those are just a small facet of Indian people in this area, indigenous people in these areas. What's most important, though, is that during the formative years, this is when what was shaping up to be the United States government was reaching out to the tribal leaders and was respecting them as individual sovereigns individual nations, where if they planned to set up shop in any one of their territories, that they needed a treaty of peace and friendship. They needed to get along and coexist just like we're doing now. And over the years, there was some pushback. Once there was enough numbers of colonizers in this territory, federal policy shifted. It shifted to be anti-indigenous. It shifted to be pro-colonial. During the allotment and assimilation age, this is where the federal government recognized what was called at the time an Indian problem. It, noticed, it noted that the, the affairs of working with these tribal nations was properly situated in the United States Department of War. We talk about smallpox, genocide, intentional killing, harming, those things we talked about earlier of how colonial domination actually plays out. This is one of the biggest heightened periods that we saw. And the laws changed to favor this practice. Indian agents were sent to live all over Indian country, just like Dances with Wolves, right? Who made friends. A lot of agents actually learned the language. They married into the tribes, and they, they, they went AWOL. And some were very self-serving. They stole money. They stole food and rations, and they also um, uh, fraudulently kept records of those, those tribal members there. So there was a lot of things going on during those allotment assimilation eras, but mainly the Department of War decided that it was the best policy of the United States of America to assimilate all the Indians into European culture, to strip them of their cultural identity, to teach them mediocre jobs, not allow them, of course, to vote, not allow them to go to universities such as this, they were not smart enough, they were incompetent. We needed to treat them as wards and that the federal government was going to be their guardians, was going to feed them, house them, provide education because they believed that 
that the indigenous people could not do it themselves. And once that era changed, the tribes realized that they could not allow this policy to go in this manner. Those tribal leaders rose up. They, they fought, they used their international laws to combine their forces, and they advocated to Congress. They learned English, they got people into colleges, and they, they worked very hard for advocacy for the Indian policy to again recognize their sovereign government. So the Indian Reorganization Act was a federal policy that acknowledged the current tribal structures and empowered those tribal governments. But again, the pendulum swung the other way. Once the government again got tired of the expense and the burden of being the guardian to the wards, it changed its policy to terminate its relationship with many of the tribes. And to this day, there are dozens of tribes on a, on a list petitioning Congress to be re-recognized, that federal relationship to be re-established for whatever reason that it was lost during that termination era not so long ago. And today, arguably, we are in the self-determination era where federal policy acknowledges tribal sovereignty and tribal self-determination, that tribes themselves, can, tribes themselves can make the laws and govern themselves, their membership, their territory, their language, their cultural resources, how they administer justice to themselves, how they buy land and hold land. We are scholars today in my field. Some say we are no longer in the self-determination and self-governance era. Some say we are back into a termination era. We are seeing federal policies developing that are opening up national parks like Bears Ears. We're seeing land applications that meet all the legal requirements being denied. We're seeing the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the arm of the federal government that services us, be stripped of all of its staff for them to be reorganized. There's lots of empty seats. People don't pick up phones. It's hard to have a meeting with them. They're not there. The White House has even dismantled its page that services the Indian um, nations. He proudly had an Indian policy section, advisors, native attorneys like myself, that helped weigh in on policy and prepare him for all the nations that he visited and set policy for. That branch of this administration is gone. The website is no longer there either. So we're not sure, and we won't know for several more years, where we are in this pendulum of swinging policy of whether tribes will be recognized, not recognized, service the way the treaty said they're supposed to be serviced, or will they be empowered again someday? I want to ask you just a few questions. I know we're, we're running short on time here. Would you mind staying just a few more minutes? I ask you this question. Who has seen the show Naked and Afraid? Some folks. If you haven't seen it, it's a television show where they pair up two total strangers. They're faced with the ultimate survival challenge. They go out for 21 days with no clothes, um, a couple of pieces of supplies, and they are situated in the most dangerous environments in the world. But actually, the drama is not about whether they can physically survive. The drama is really about who carries an ego and how you can effectively share space with another person in order to survive. And the ones that, are, that team up and share space the best end up making it those 21 days. So for whatever reason this brings you to me now, you have made a choice to live in Dejop. Think to yourself. If we removed all of the modern day conveniences of the air conditioning in your homes, the heating in your homes, automobiles, grocery stores, bottled water, all other modern technology, that awesome iPhone that you have in your pocket right now, would you be able to physically survive here in Dejo? And if you could, how long do you think you would survive? Now in a matter of hours from this point right now, you would need to eat. In 2016, the population of Dejope is 252,551. If we all ventured out to physically survive right now, what would happen? The zombie apocalypse? What would you eat? What would, how would you catch it? What plants can you eat? What parts of the plant can you eat? 
What if you need medicine? What's in season right now? Where would you get your water? Would you get it from the lakes? Do you know where the springs are in this area? The freshwater springs? How would you carry it even if you found it? Okay, so maybe you would use a, a bladder or an organ from an animal, but back to animals. How would you kill or trap that animal? What would you use? Where would you get those materials? And how would you build your house? What would you insulate it with in these lovely day job winters? More than anything, I would probably ask you, would you phone a friend? <laughs> friends, right? What friends, look around the room, what friends do you have that you could ask for help? Now, the real question is, are they your friends? <laughs> I see the scene from Hunger Games, where they come up, they're hoisted up on these platforms into the game space, and they desperately look at each other. You can hear their, them breathing, because they know there's only so many resources and places to go, and everybody wants it, right? Think of that scene. So that brings me back to why we're here, and that's the human experience. There are all kinds of models and theories, and even with my fancy behavioral sciences and law degree from the University of Wisconsin, I'm not here to promote any of them. But I will tell you that they do include some of the same common elements. What you need as a human being sitting here in those chairs looking right at me right now, you have the need to feel connected. You need to feel like you belong to something bigger than yourself. You need to feel secure that your human needs are going to be met. This is reasons why you actually make your rent payment, right? You also long to experience diversity. You want variety in front of you. What makes you feel great as a human being is the ability to make a choice, that you have choices. That variety is important. You want to be able to love people, and you want to be loved by people. You want to feel that your life has purpose, that you can take yourself to a higher place and that it has some meaning, it has some impact, it has some legacy. So that's where shared spaces is most relevant to you as individual human beings sitting in front of me. One of the most relevant needs a human has is to grow. Growth is a journey, it's not a destination. It involves developing your spirituality, your emotional state of mind, your overall wellness. You want to also sit here and advance your intellect. You want to be physically fit. This is all growth. We tend to like to grow with other humans, so we don't really like always doing this by ourselves. At some point, we like to grow with other people next to us. And it leads almost circularly and holistically with all those other needs we just mentioned. Once you grow, you're more lovable and you're more able to love. You're more secure. You have more choices in front of you. So this idea of growth as a human being is what motivates you to be part and to be mindful of the space around you. Because if you practice mindfulness, you are in self, yourself growing. So I close with a couple of points. As members of this society, politics and social structures tend to divide us. Again, even the, this is the oldest trick in the book, right? And oftentimes it's ever so subtle. You can walk out this door and you can find a way that society, the, the construct of society, has divided you from some other person even near you. These spaces that I'm talking about here, they're sacred, and they are a medium for you. They are a place for conflicting groups. They were made for international travel. They were made for you to come here today and now, to be in the now. They weren't meant to be pictures or destroyed or sitting in museums in black and whites where you put on white gloves to thumb through these pictures. They were meant for you to go out there, and sit next to them, and think and grow and be part of them, take them in. These are sacred places. Who remembers when the Cathedral of Notre Dame burned recently? Was it not all over the media? Millions of dollars to repair it before the thing even finished burning? That's cultural property value. People value that. From a child story, the hunchback story that we all heard, that value was ingrained over time to each one of us. And as people got older and wealth grew, they were willing to commit that 
so that that value can be ingrained in the next generation. That same property value is what I'm talking about here. The Ho-Chunks have kept these places together. Stewards, non-Ho-Chunks, have worked hard to preserve these mounds and these sacred spaces, the mounds that go up Bascom Hill. Did you know you're walking up next to a graveyard when you go to class? Did you know when you wake up in the morning you're walking by more burials? Those all have been saved over the years, and there are medicines, not just human bodies there, medicines and powerful energies that are there for you to experience and absorb and take in and be part of the space while you're here. We jokingly say these, these medicines here in Dejop are so powerful that people never leave. I like to say 10 years from now, I'll see a lot of the same faces in front of me here on campus or somewhere else in the community. They're addictive. This is one of the best places in the world to live. We win that award for a reason, right? It's great to be a student here. It's great to be a mother here. It's great to be a wife here. It's great to be a professional here. It's great to be a professor here. Thank you for coming tonight. We do have time for questions and answers for those of you that would like to stay and ask questions. Um, I also invite my um, indigenous colleagues, if you'd like to come and join me up here and, and be available for answers or come up when you feel like you'd like to contribute to an answer, I welcome you. Um, you're just as much a part of the answer as I am, so I welcome you here. Um, if you guys have uh, questions you want to ask, um, I'd like to... I'd ask you guys, we only have 15 minutes left, but I'd like to ask you guys to just line up in an orderly fashion just around here if you have questions you want to ask and they could be answered. We have another microphone over on yep. the other side of the auditorium as well. So yep. just form a single file line on either side um, and try to keep your questions short as possible so that we can get to as many as we can. All right, you want to go first? Um, my question is, how do you envision a shared future for all? My vision, my vision is actually, a, it's a chapter book, and it starts, it starts with this image right here, where folks want to take time away from their families and their studies and their obligations and their jobs, and take time to commit to learn, just learning just a little bit of something first, and, and growing from that. And you're going to grow at your own pace, in your own journey, and likely, and I say likely because this happens more than I ever anticipated, our paths will cross again. They just do. <clears throat> um, what would be your response with like, the idea of like, people stealing land and what's going on with climate change and the way our lakes look in Madison now? Oh yeah, that's a loaded question. So there's uh, <laughs> the, the um, Save the Lakes initiative, definitely as a professional have, have, have challenged my colleagues to come and attend and, and, and donate and support the financing it takes to clean these lakes up. I can tell you I left for five years and lived in Arizona with my husband and moved back and I could not believe the change in the quality of the lakes. And I could not believe you know, the leaves and the pickup and the, the, the effect that they have of phosphates in the lakes. Um, so I was, I was taken back because it was very noticeable to me leaving this community for five years and coming back. And yes, I'm very, um, very aggressively supportive of all of the programs and science that will help us save the lakes. Now in terms of the global um, climate strike, you know, my daughter's sitting up here on her cell phone probably animating something, but she participated in the global strike. She is very much an environmental justice warrior. And it's funny how complex social problems can pretend to be and how our political leaders can, can change the, the, the agenda and change the, the narrative so easily. Um, and I really appreciate my law degree to kind of cut through the BS and really see things for what they are and my appreciation for science. I'm not saying that you know, I'm the expert in, in what the answer is. I'm saying that it is wonderful for the youth not to have the BS or the games, that they have, a, they have a voice and they may not be able to vote, 
but someday they will, and they're learning from each other how to exercise that voice, and it's something we should listen to. Um, traditionally, from a lot of indigenous tribes that I've worked with, the youth are very powerful. They're very much empowered. Um, there are many elaborate ceremonies that celebrate different points in, in, the, in the youth and where they are in their lives. And unfortunately, I believe in, in European culture that even the way I've grown up, um, we've, we've abandoned those celebrations. And we, we are so busy telling kids what they are being too loud, too crazy, you know, um, you know not, not doing their chores, you know, these traditional colonial expectations of our children. Um, and there's this mass movement in Indian country. Attorneys like myself and my friends, they've all kind of quit their jobs and they've bought parcels of land and they're growing organic crops and they're taking their kids out of school and they are teaching them indigenuity about all of the, the foods, the sciences, how we actually did them, how to count with your fingers and, and do trick and calculus with your two hands. There's so much information out there that is being shared and renewed and revitalized throughout Indian country that I look at the global strike um, or the, the global climate strike and I, I think of of the fact that it takes this international movement of youth that is being listened to in some regards. Um, it's quite phenomenal. It's very consistent with indigenous culture. The bay on the south end of Lake Monona is finally, finally receiving a proper name. Could you please pronounce the new name for us? The bay on Monona, I'm sorry, I don't know the name. On the, well, I, I don't want to say the name of the bay that is now. Oh, it was, it was, I'm not afraid, it was Squaw, is it Squaw? Yeah. Okay, it was Squaw, yes. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's now going to be the word for muskrat, I believe? Muskrat, oh, I should know that, that's my favorite meat. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know it, but, um, you know, people, people don't like to eat, like, rodent meat, but that's normal. Dejo, one of its biggest delicacies is the muskrat in this area. And ever since I was a kid, um, I was always, you know, you get, you get famed for the good things you do, right? And then you end up wanting to do that for your living. I wasn't told I was a great lawyer. I was told I was a great muskrat cleaner. Because <laughs> I could get those glands out like no tomorrow. And, the, you know, what ruins wild game is, is, you know, the glands and people not cleaning the meat properly, lazy, lazy butchering. Um, and so that was one of the things I was very proud of is, is I would um, clean the glands out of the muskrat and we would roast them and they would just taste like a filet mignon. And they, they still do. So um, you're missing out. I mean, all this money we're paying for beef. Um, we have something better than that right across the street here. Um, I'm sorry I don't know the name of muskrat and Ho-Chunk. I should. I've eaten my share. I've plucked out glands for many years. Hi. Um, my question is also on naming. Um, I came from Minnesota. I'm new here, um, and there was a lot of controversy over renaming a lake, um, Bidet Makaska, and I was wondering if you could talk about what you feel is the power of renaming things um, to the native name. Right, and, and before there's the power of it, there's, again, you have to acknowledge the colonial dominant side of it, right? I mean, and it happens in all cultures, it's not just in indigenous things, where colonial culture says, if I can't pronounce your name, if it doesn't rhyme with Smith, then you don't matter. I'm not going to learn your name, <laughs> you know. And it's really difficult because, um, you know, even working with all these tribes in all these different languages, um, language is so important. Language is culture. And once we strip the language, every one of these lakes and all of these paths and every community you live in right now has a ho chunk name to it. And there's a description there where there were definitely um, Indian trails out to your home or where your home was or is located. So, so naming is really a revitalization tactic. It is a way to take back, and it's what's, I think, phenomenal, and, and we, we miss this part, that somebody still remembers the name of that space, what it was called, and when you interpret, if you ever sit down with a tribe, any tribe, and they talk about a space and they give it a name, it's, it's really phenomenal that it's never anything boring. It's a very meaningful name, a well-thought-out, purposeful name. Um, and, and it has so much more meaning than the English language can usually translate um, for you. And, and if you ask them to explain it, you know, there's probably two or three, they kind of hesitate often, and they'll tell you uh, of the way they explain places. And it's, it's, so, it's such a beautiful thing, right, to see them speak their own language, one, to know it, and, and three, to try to describe it and, and break it down for you and choose, you know, 20 different English words to try to describe its meaning and how it got that name. So that's a very, to me, a very special 
um, way that we, we share our space and we revitalize those meanings because, you know, we can say Monona, but we don't really know what Monona means. Um, and th there's all kinds of like Daywalk and Chunk where, it, where Baraboo Devil's Lake is. There's lots of, lots of history behind Devil's Lake. And when you go there, you know, how to conduct yourself because of that powerful energy and our stories of what happened in that location. Um, so those names have power. Um, and they also connect you, and they're not foreign. And that's the biggest problem we can ever make is when we go anywhere in this world, is to look at a word that we can't pronounce and dismiss it. That's the biggest mistake you'll make because you will not be connected. You will not grow. In fact, you will, you're doing the opposite. You know, you're, you're, you're purposefully not growing. You're becoming smaller when you do those things. So naming that body of water to its original name and restoring that name and its power, it is very powerful. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here tonight. This was an excellent speech. Um, I'm really interested in the transnational power of indigenous communities, and you kind of touched on it when you were talking about your time at the United Nations. And a lot of indigenous communities are impacted by the legacy of settler colonialism. How do you band together and fight for meaningful change at the same time as recognizing the individual legacies that they are different based on each place? Yeah, you know, that's it's really hard because you know, again, in, in our colonial teachings of indigenous peoples, we're taught that Indians are Indians. It's just one group. But even today, there are 573 recognized, federally recognized Indian nations. And there are so many, I said, on the docket that are sitting there waiting to restore their federal recognition with the federal government. There are over 50 tribal nations that are recognized by states. States kind of got tired of having entire tribal communities within their state boundaries and said, well, if the federal government isn't going to recognize you, we as attorney generals, we as the state legislature are going to empower ourselves to recognize you as a state tribe. So there are over 50 tribes that are recognized by states but not by the federal government. So we're talking over, what, 600 and, what, 20 tribal nations. And I think, again, another, another um, common misstep is that folks, when they say Indians, they think all Indians. And that is like saying, you know, five continents worth of, of countries that you know today, lumping them together and say the people that aren't Americans, they believe this. You can't say that. Um, and again, um, location and being land tied as indigenous peoples, these sacred spaces matter. Um, those spaces define their culture, their foundation, their history, and their identity. And once they've been re removed and, and forcefully removed and relocated, and they set up shop somewhere else, most of the places I go, these tribes have um, been from somewhere else. And they have made a home over the past 150 years in these new spaces but it doesn't remove the sanctity and the, the, the connection they have with their old homes that they gave up through land sessions, treaties, or outright theft. Um, so the question of international law, how do you band all these nations together to have a universal voice? Um, that's actually a, a very relevant question today, and here's why it's relevant. Um, when we were forming the Declaration of Independence in the United States Constitution, as you might know, has been modeled in, in some parts um, against the Haudenosaunee um, Great Law of Peace. Um, and I talked earlier about some of these explorer diaries of how does these tribal governments work? They were really analytical on how they could have this beautiful space and these riches and not know taxes and not know a crown. Um, so certainly those ways of life were, were being studied by explorers and they did make it into the modeling of the United States legal system that we know today, the United States government. One of the things that occurred during all of those formative years I mentioned in these policy swings um, was that the, the, the tribal leaders at the time were promised a seat in Congress. Did you know that? Yes, the United States government during the treaty era when they tried to reconcile a lot of treaty breaches and things that were coming their way down the pike, um, they did promise the tribes that they would have a seat in Congress to represent their interests. In fact, there was an, an era where the forced relocations were bringing tribes from all over the country down to Oklahoma. Why Oklahoma? Well, at that time, Oklahoma was thought to be a nothing state. There were no resources. Um, there was nothing for them to live on, and it would be one state that would have that member of Congress come from that state, and all those nations would all live together in the state of Oklahoma. In fact, I'm scared to death to practice law in Oklahoma because the laws are so screwy because of this history. Um, one of the things that came from that, though, is that this promise was never fulfilled, right, by Congress, and it's a treaty promise. So in the last couple of months, the great Cherokee nation of, um, of Oklahoma has um, positioned Kim Teehee, 
who has been a congressional aide for a number of years, um, to be the representative and fill that seat, rather than wait for Congress to tell us who, um, or the process to fill the seat, the Cherokee Nation received a, an abundant amount of support from the other tribal nations to go and nominate Kim Teehee as this congressional seat holder. And um, she's in the process of, of federal recognition <laughs> for that seat. So if you want to read the papers about the Cherokee Nation and the indigenous Indian seat in Congress and Kim Teehee, um, that's a fascinating twist to this history, right? And again, are we in self-determination or, or not? Are we, and that's a good true test, right? If the tribes are self-determining their representative in Congress um, through an old treaty promise, um, then maybe we're still in self-determination. But if Kim Teehee is not well received by Congress, maybe we are facing that termination policy or phase that we are so concerned about. Um, so collectively, I will tell you, if you go to NCAI.org, National Congress of American Indians, as a response to um, this promised seat in Congress, the tribes, the old, tribes created an old conglomerate of, of, of credentialed tribal leaders called the National Congress of American Indians. And this organization is a large nonprofit based out of DC. And they, um, I think they have about 40 employees. Um, and they work for tribes. So the tribes pass resolutions affecting them, murdered and missing indigenous women, for example, for causes, um, positions on federal legislation that affect Indian country that were not thought of. Um, they, they pass resolutions at their um, annual and semi-annual meetings, and they, um, their staff delivers them to members of Congress, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs, the House um, Natural Resources Committee, and then, of course, all of the delegates from, obviously, the, the districts that matter around that issue. So there are... Um, there are ways that tribes come together and have a collective voice. If they disagree on things, which they certainly do, <laughs> quite a bit as a matter of fact, um, then NCAI will typically not entertain a resolution on that subject matter. Um, okay, sorry, I actually, I myself also personally do have a question for you. So I feel like this might be a bit vague or it might even be a bit loaded, but like, so the, you talked about how earlier there's a lot of um, colonialist rhetoric all around us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and so that goes to these basic human behavioral sciences of, of unlearning um, unhealthy ways, right? Uh, and again, it, it's just, it's still cultural sensitivity, it's reflection. Um, and, and I always challenge folks um, when they ask me, well, what would an indigenous person do for my problem? And they explain their problem. Um, and in this case, what would you do to decolonize my life a little bit more? Um, well, you can make day-to-day -day choices, right? You have individual human sovereignty. You can choose where you spend your time, how you spend your time, where you spend your money, um, how you cast your vote, um, what, what causes you want to, to move forward with. Um, and, and certainly, there's, there's radical positions you can take, right? And then there's more, more um, less radical positions you can take. And, and most folks, um, I think, when it comes to decolonizing is, is trying to really figure out how brainwashed are you, right? Like, how much decolonization do you need, do you think you need to feel good with yourself? Um, and, and like I said, a lot of my colleagues that um, do what I do have made these choices. Um, they've, they've, again, bought smaller homes, sold their big homes, sold their fancy cars, they're biking everywhere. Um, reintroducing horses and livestock and, and traditional foods, um, helping restore populations, like the Ho-Chunk just helped restore the elk population in Wisconsin, um, the wolf population. So there are, are so many causes that will restore the resources for you not to be dependent upon colonial you know, niceties, nice, niceties and um, that corporate consumerism that is you know, constantly pounded um, down on all of us in every medium we can think of. All right, um, uh, just an FYI, it is um, a little past nine o'clock. So um, uh, we wanna respect her time. So, and thank you so much for coming to speak. Thank you for um, having me. Thank you.